Have you ever wondered about the reality of angels, the origin of angels, the purpose of angels, and whether or not there are guardian angels? Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I have two of my colleagues on the set with me today. And uh, first is Nathan Jones, who is our internet evangelist, and the other is Tim Moore, our associate evangelist and my designated successor. Now, if you are a regular viewer of this program, I'm sure that you have noticed that Nathan is not in his usual position. He is in what we call the hot seat. And the reason for that is because we're going to throw all the questions at him. And Nathan, I want to get started fast here. So here comes the first one. Okay. Hang on. All right. Put on your seat belt. All right. All right here seat. we go. Feeling hot. Let's just begin with the obvious <clears throat> question. What in the world got you interested in angels? Well, you know, I took angels for granted, for granted until my parents got in a really bad car accident. I mean, it was so bad that when the other car hit him head on, it pushed the engine block into the passenger seat and crushed my mother. And my father, even though he was pretty badly banged up, crawled out and passed out on the pavement. Well, all of a sudden he heard this Harley Davidson motorcycle roll up and he loves motorcycles. So he knew what it was and he saw the chrome wheel and all of a sudden this big biker guy all clad in leather and, and bandanas with heaven's angels on the back of his jacket, lift him up and put him in the grass and then tear the door off of my mother's car to help her and then checked on the other car. Well, I didn't hear about this until I, uh, hours later when my father was in the hospital and he said, he called and said, well, I was talking to the paramedic and I wanted the paramedic to thank the biker for helping me. And the paramedic's like, uh, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. And they took to the policeman, did, did you see that biker that helped out? He says, there's no biker here. And to this day, my father <clears throat> was sure that an angel came to help him. Well, I kind of believed the story, but then I was skeptical. I'm like, why am I skeptical? I've been a student of the Bible all my life. I went to Bible college and seminary and all, and, and I should believe that there's angels at work in this day and age. Well, they are, but I was skeptical. And that's what really actually got me into studying angels, or which angelology, which is the study and of so angels. So that's the reason that you have this motorcyclist on the cover of your book, right? Right. Coming yeah. down a highway. I call him the biker angel because he's, my parents aren't the only one who's been rescued by a Harley Davidson driving biker <laughs> who mysteriously disappears. And I put some stories in the book here. But as I wanted to learn more and more about angels, I uh, talked to a good friend of mine, Vic Batista, and he's a pastor in my, uh, down in Miami area. And he and I do a radio show every week. And he said, well, you know, if you really want to learn more about angels, you need to go to the book of Revelation. He says there are 72 distinct angels or groups of angels that can be found in the book of Revelation. He says, why don't we teach through it for a year and you'll learn more and more. And sure enough, the more I studied about angels in the book of Revelation, I realized that, well, Revelation means an unveiling. So, Revelation unveils or takes off the veil that hides us from the spirit world. And we can really understand more about God's mighty angels, His messengers, is what angel means, messengers, Malik in the Hebrew or Angelos in the Greek, and understand more about angels. So, in this book, I, not only do we learn a whole lot about angels, but we learn a whole lot about Revelation. Well, did you find that uh, Vic's advice was true, that there is more information in the book of Revelation about angels than any other place in the Bible? Well, there's 108 references to angels in the Old Testament and 176 references in the New Testament. 72 of those are just in the book of Revelation alone. I mean, there are angels throughout the Old Testament. Talk about uh, Jacob wrestling with an angel. There was an angel garden, uh, the Garden of Eden, so that Adam and Eve couldn't get back in. Angels showed up to destroy armies. So we get in the New Testament, they announced Jesus Christ's birth. They were there at the tomb when he was resurrected. They were there when he ascended to heaven. All sorts of angels throughout the Bible. But I was like, we got the church today. 
do we really still need angels? And that's what Vic challenged me on. Do angels work for the Lord in this day and age? And as I studied more and more, I realized, yes, He does. The well, angels. That, that makes me ask a question. And by the way, Nathan, I love the opening story that you just recounted of your father encountering the biker angel. As a matter of fact, I'll drive down the road looking for bikers in a different light from now on, uh, because that was such a personal story. And I've had similar experiences with friends who recount that they've seen or suspect that they've encountered an angel in their own lives. But you mentioned all the angels throughout the Bible. Why did you decide to focus just on the angels in Revelation in this particular book? It was because, uh, for one, I, I love the book of Revelation. Obviously. I mean, after all, we're a Bible prophecy ministry. Revelation is the book that we love to study. Uh, but two, it's the amount of angels. There are 72 angels or groups of angels found in the book of Revelation. And there is more angels in that book than throughout the rest of the Bible. So, if you really want to know how God works through His angels, then that is the great book. And He works through them in so many different ways. You've got guardian angels and worship angels. Uh, there's some are instrumental. Some are carry the throne of God, the, the cherubim. Mm -hmm. so there, are, there are warrior angels. There are, are protector angels. There are nurturing angels who help feed people and, and nurture them and rescue them. There's those angels that when you die, they escort you up to heaven. I mean, there are so many angels found in the book of Revelation that is, that's really pretty much the place to go to. Well, what to have you found it. to be some of the most <clears throat> common misconceptions that people have about angels. <laughs> well, if you grew up like me in Americana here, you have these children's books from the 60s and 70s, and they have beautiful illustrations of these, these white guys with curly hair, and they have these beautiful feathery wings, and a, this metal halo somehow floats up over their head, and they're all stoic, and they look like they're wearing togas. And I just assume that, you know, that's what angels look like all the time. But when you read Revelation, you realize that angels Sure, they're, they're spirit beings. They have physical bodies. They're, they're not ghosts. Uh, also, they, uh, they don't all look the same. Some, like the seraphim, for instance, have faces of, of like a lion and an ox and an eagle. Some do look human. Some can change their forms. And, and some can take on human form. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, for instance, when uh, Abraham was walking with the, with the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ, a name for Jesus Christ. We read in Revelation 1 and 19, Jesus unmasked in His true glorification, and it's tr truly astounding to read what Jesus really looks like when His earthly body is, is the glory comes out like it's a transfiguration. Oh, I love and how you highlight even in Revelation how at times the angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ, and yet you, you point out that some people sometimes misperceive that certain angels might be Jesus, and they're not. And so you have been very clear in giving credit to where Jesus appears in the descriptive terms that John uses as the angel of the Lord. It's important to understand when we say angels, we're saying messengers. So, when you read, when I say the 72 angels or groups of angels, they're not all of the celestial class, the angelic beings. Some are messengers. John, for instance, was a messenger for the Lord, the apostles. Uh, the angel of the Lord was God's messenger, even though it was God Himself. Mm -hmm. He was treated not as an angel, but as God. They, the Jacob and Gideon and all gave him great reverence. And so, whoever is a messenger for the Lord, I, I put under the category of angels. You and I could be considered angels because we are messengers of the Lord. Well, I want so to get to back to misconceptions. Yes. Because there's lots of misconceptions, and you haven't even touched on them. For example, <clears throat> a lot of people believe. That Christians become angels. That is a huge misconception. Uh, I think we get that from uh, It's a Wonderful Life, right? When Clarence said, uh, <laughs> go to blame When it on a the bell movie. rings, an angel gets its wings. Hey, now, that's one of my favorite movies. Now, <laughs> it's a great movie. movie. I was pulling for Clarence all I through was, that movie. And he got his wings. <laughs> but that's theologically incorrect. We Angels are a separate class. If you go to the book of Job, it talks about how the angels rejoicing as God created. So we know they that were God, there at the time of creation. Yeah, they saw the creation. So they are a creation separate and apart. They stay angels. We are not angels. We are a separate creation. Now, it's interesting. People look at angels and, oh, you know, they got all these great powers. And when we, you go through the mighty angels of Revelation, you see that some of them are so powerful they could destroy planets if needed, thanks to God's power. But when you read about them, you realize that in the Old Testament, they were called sons of God. They were the, the mighty sons of God. But you go to the New Testament, where after Jesus died on the cross, 
and Christians become the sons of God. The positions change instead of the angels being above us, we become above the angels. Even though they're more powerful, we are the ones given breath by God. We are made in His image. And so we are over the angels. And that should encourage any Christian who's involved in spiritual warfare. And we are constantly in spiritual warfare with the fallen angels, which are demons. Well, that brings up the question. Obviously, there are some who have fallen from grace and uh, are now opposing not only God but us. What did your research and, and your study of Revelation tell you about the demonic angels, those uh, demons that uh, work with Satan himself? Well, Paul told us that we are fighting a war against spirits and principalities and powers. In other words, behind human government and you know oh, about yes. human government and yes, the Kentucky State it. Legislature, that there are satanic forces working behind the scenes. And Revelation goes all the way back to Genesis and it tells the story, especially in Revelation 12, how Satan as a red dragon was the most, he was named Lucifer. He was the guardian over God's throne. He was the worship leader. And after all that time he wanted the worship to start going to him and not to God. And so, he, the first sin that came was pride. And he led a third of the demons, or angels I should say at the time, to follow him. They tried to overthrow God, which it's impossible to overthrow God. And God cast them out and sent them down to earth. Now, there's another misconception about angels when it comes to demons, is that there's actually two groups of demons. There's the ones that have been disembodied and live on this earth to afflict mankind and to look to possess people. But there's another group, and we read about these in the trumpet judgments, that are being held. They are so terrible. I mean, they are, they are world shattering, super powerful demons. They have a general called Abaddon. Many of them look like locusts, terribly frightening looking things. They have these chimera type steeds that they ride. And they lead a 200 million man army. And as part of the judgments that God's going to do on the earth, He's going to release these demons that are being kept for that time onto the earth to punish mankind during the tribulation. So there's actually a misconception about demons. There's, they're not, they're, they're not uh, symbolic of evil, you know, they're not just a figment of our imagination. They are real created beings that have rebelled against God and are destined to their I fate. I thought you had hell. a great point in your book, Nathan, when you said we need to be aware of them and wary of them. Not afraid of them, but we don't need to become fixated on them lest we be drawn into kind of a darkness ourselves. And so there's a proper balance to understanding and again, uh, recognizing the Lord has protected us, but not becoming fixated on oh, demons. Oh, absolutely. When I took angelology back in Bible college, it was my first year, our professor was actually very hesitant to talk about what's called demonology, the study of demons. He says, because for that very reason, you can start getting so fixated into it and so interested in the demonic world that it'll start dragging you into it. And many a Christian has given up on their faith to chase after the occult. Now we got to remember, and this is what's great about the book of Revelation, it's Jesus' victory story. And it's His victory over Satan, and it's His victory over the demons. The demons are defeated. Why anyone would want to side with them is beyond me. Uh, one of my favorite verse about angels is not in the book of Revelation. Okay. It's in the book of Hebrews. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 14 says, Are there not ministering spirits sent out to render service? For the sake of those who will inherit salvation. That's speaking of angels. It says they are ministering servants sent to serve those of us who are going to inherit salvation. I use that verse all the time. When I get ready to go on a trip, I ask the Lord to post an angel at my house to protect it. When uh, I get ready to fly in an airplane, I say, Lord, surround this plane with your angels and fly with us every mo moment of the way. Uh, I have been praying earnestly that God would surround. Stand fast, O Yenna, in Nigeria, in his camp of Christian refugees with angels to protect them from the demonic forces there in that country. Mm -hmm. So I use that verse all the time uh, as a ministry of angels. Angels clearly have a position not only as messengers but as guardians. The argument could be made that little children all have guardian angels as well. Uh, the Lord obviously has all the power in the world to do anything He wants, but He chooses to use that power through not only His angelic beings, but through Christians, through the church too. Amen. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Nathan Jones about his fascinating new book titled The Mighty Angels of Revelation. 
Well, Nathan, I see you've brought somebody new to our set, so why don't you go ahead and introduce her? Oh, it's my great pleasure to finally meet in person after two years of working together, Shalise Stevens. Uh, when I set out to do a book on angels, I didn't want to just be text. I wanted you to connect to the angels and by visual. And I couldn't do that. I can't draw a stick figure with the life of me. So I wrote all the local Christian colleges. And I was like, well, I would like someone new and fresh who, who might fit this. And I gave them a profile. Sure enough, Abilene Christian College recommended Shalise Stevens. And not only was she a student, but she had a master's degree as well. We put a little art contest against a few of the other different artists. and. Vic and I decided she had the, the look we were going for. So uh, instead of me telling you your background, why don't you share what's your background? Uh, yes, I have a BFA in graphic design from Abilene Christian. And then I have an MFA in painting from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, and I've worked as an illustrator for a while. I worked even before I went to school, I worked as an artist. And so, you, you work with paintings now, right? That's your primary interest is I, painting? I do. Yeah, I like paintings. I mean, I love illustration and watercolor and pen and ink. Um, I'm always trying to get back to having enough studio space to get back to oil painting. That's my favorite thing. And mm -hmm. your full-time job is restoring? Yes, paintings? I'm an art conservator. Um, spe specifically, uh, sorry, specifically a paintings conservator. Okay. Mm -hmm, so I repair paintings and clean paintings. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you have to almost be like a chemistry student yeah, to do exactly. a job like that. There is chemistry that. involved, yes. Yeah, so. Well, what's your inspiration? Because when we wanted to create a certain look, uh, as you can see behind you, there's one of your angels right there. What is your inspiration for how you do art? I actually really love the artists of the early 20th century, the illustrators like um, maybe Kai Nielsen, Maxfield Parrish, those kind of illustrators that really pull a lot from, they pull from myth and fairy tales, kind of a fanciful style, but with a lot of ornamentation and detail. I really mm. love to get into the detail, so that's where it comes Being from. Being a sci-fi guy, I love your 1950s kind oh, of era sci-fi yes. illustrations that she does. You're, you, you do all sorts of genres. What's your favorite genre? Uh, probably maybe a sort of sci-fi fantasy combination. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of like to do my own little, recently I've gotten into that, just doing kind of my own style. Well, Shalise, mm -hmm. I was fascinated by the variety of angels that you and Nathan obviously had a vision for. How did he communicate to you and how did you envision the various angels that you depicted artistically throughout the book? Yeah, he would email me descriptions and also plenty of like verses to read about the angels so I could get a really good feel of, I, I'm actually a preacher's kid, so I've encountered <laughs> some of these before, but um, got a lot of information about kind of a description. And then we just would discuss like how we wanted it to look, like how we wanted to express like the power behind this particular angel or the sort of uh, biblical references that we could find. The problem is, is that she had Vic and I both being guys, and we always wanted her to beef up all these guys. Like the stone angel, for instance, who throws a giant stone down upon the Antichrist capital and destroys it. Poor woman had to keep on making him more and more like Schwarzenegger by the time she was done. But uh, y'all really into like sort of the comic book, like. Well, yeah. You had to pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she did it. We tried to stay very much to the Bible. We didn't mm -hmm. want to leave what the Bible said. Obviously, some creativity had it. That's where, where Shalise comes in. Her creativity is yeah. just, I just love. Can you, have, we have 12, because there's 12 sections in the book, and you made 12 illustrations. Mm -hmm. Can you show me maybe two or three, four of your favorite of the illustrations? Now, I love them all. So it's probably <laughs> like, what's who's your favorite kid, right? Right. But maybe you could show us one of them. Um, Definitely, I was really fond of the seraphim, mm. the one that was like a combination. This one was really fun to draw just because it was such a combination of different um, types and with the lion's head. And I had plenty of room for a lot of information to add on here for ornamentation. I love the, what it, the Bible says about them in Revelation 4, 6. They're talking about God's throne room. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes, uh, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures each had six wings, were full of eyes all around within. And they did not rest or day or night saying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, when people think of angels, and we said that in an earlier segment, we tend to think of just, you know, very standard Americana type, but these angels kind of blow that imagery out of existence, doesn't it? Right, right. There was a lot to work with there. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's your second favorite? Uh, I really, 
enjoyed doing the Sun Angel. Oh, the Sun Angel. That yes. one was because we really like kind of branched out on that one, like as far as uh, going really creative with the style and a little bit more like ominous, maybe this one. Mm. It, that was in, interesting to get into. Well, mm. the story behind it is, is ominous. If you go to Revelation 19, and then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, and so forth and so on. And what the reference is, is that this angel is calling all the birds to come and feast on all those who will die in the Valley of Armageddon. It's, he's the intro angel, so to speak, for the Battle of Armageddon, showing that even though Satan's forces want to destroy the Lord, the Lord had already called it that he's going to win, because he announced that he, he had the cleanup crew all prepared and ready for the destruction. Mm -hmm. And th that's one of the darker angels, definitely, in the storyline. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, I also, oh, I think you and I both like the Wind Angel. Oh, the Wind Angel, fun. yes, the Wind Angel. What do you like about the Wind Angel? Um, um, I do enjoy sort of like this kind of almost the Lord of the Rings sort of <laughs> look to it. Tim's like, like those two. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed working on the armor Hello. basically. Just thinking of really creative ways to make this armor and uh, doing more of like an action shot. That was really fun to work on. So for, for a novice, sure. Charlize, how long would it take you to actually craft and create a given depiction of an angel. How many hours or days and probably weeks of time mm -hmm. thinking about and preparing, but once you sit down and begin to draw. Right. Uh, probably, gosh, I want to say that there were maybe eight hours in each one, I would say. And we did several what's called passes. So I would do a sketch. I would send it to them. They would approve the sketch. I would work on the next stage of it, send it to them. They would say, oh, can you change this or shift this or maybe make this a little different to represent the angel better? So there was a lot of stuff. Well, obviously, when I asked that question, I'm reminded that Dr. Reagan asked an artist one time how long it took him to paint a, a beautiful painting. And he gave a number of years, but basically he said it took a lifetime, a lifetime of preparation. And for you all, it took years of study and preparation on your part to have that kind of gift uh, be manifest. And then many, many hours, countlessly over weeks, for you all to interact, to come up with the idea and agree on the vision you were trying to put on paper. Well, that's the beauty of working with Shalice is that it was like 90% right by the time it came to Vic oh, and I to look okay. at. And then it's like, well, can you just move the bowl over, or beef the guys up? We, we, you know, but your armor, I, that's what I love about the, the Wind Angel's my favorite. And as a matter of fact, that's why we put the Wind Angel on the cover. Uh, it's got wings. Most people can relate to angels with wings. But if you go to Revelation 7, it says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. So the Lord actually, we learn from this, uses his angels not only as messengers and guardians, but to control the very weather. Mm -hmm. So when we start worrying about global warming or climate change or stuff, we, we can be sure that God's got the weather under under control. You know, Shalise, I asked you off mm -hmm. camera, but I'm going to ask you again. One of the things that is so beautiful about our Creator God is He creates with such beauty and magnificence, and yet within our own lives He allows us to sort of fill in and color uh, what He's already made beautiful. One of the things I really appreciate about your artwork is you've done it in a pen and ink style, and I asked, would a person be able to use this to color in and make these angels even unique and personalized for them without offending you, the artist who right. created them so beautifully in the first place. No, not at all. I've actually published a couple of coloring books. So I'm, I love doing the black and white ink drawing and you can take it from there. So, so our Nathan, book doubles not only as a <laughs> teaching book, but a coloring book. Yourself. And every person can personalize it for themselves in that regard. Ms. Shalise, thank you very much both for working with Nathan and for coming on today oh, to course. Christ in Prophecy. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Welcome back once again to Christ in Prophecy in our interview with Nathan Jones about his excellent new book titled, The Mighty Angels of Revelation. Well, Nathan, I know in your Minor Prophets book you had a really neat idea to use some clever imaginative stories to introduce each Minor Prophet. I'm so glad you did that again in this book with The Mighty Angels. How did you come about doing that once again? Well, there's so many people have different learning styles, and some people read, some listen, some watch. Well, we provided the read, I provided the, the illustrations, the watch, but some people 
need story to connect. And so I, I did the story of, of John uh, as he's taken off of Patmos and he's guided by the revealing angel mm -hmm. and given a tour throughout the book of Revelation. Two or three pages, maybe four at the beginning each section. Very well, fun. I think that's very effective mm -hmm. in, in the way you do that writing, and I'm glad you included it in Praise this book. Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, Nathan, what is the most important truth that you want people to take away from this book? Two words. Okay. Jesus wins. The book of Revelation <laughs> isn't about angels, it isn't about the tribulation, it's about Jesus Christ getting His kingdom. Matter of fact, it's so important to read the book of Revelation that Revelation 1 3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. If you read the book of Revelation, you are promised a blessing, and you're blessed because you know that if Jesus wins and then His children we win as well. And no other book of the Bible promises that, although of course you will, will, will receive blessings by reading a book. But this promises it right up front. And not only that, but it also has a curse at the end. If you mess with the book of Revelation <laughs> or change it, then you will get the curses as and well. And yet, it's one of the most ignored books in all of Christendom. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Preachers don't preach on it. In fact, you know our colleague Don Perkins, who is a full-time Bible prophecy teacher, grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and his uh, preacher told him every year, we're not going to talk about the book of Revelation because if you read the book of Revelation, you'll go crazy. Crazy? Yes, crazy. I feel People were scared of it. They were, they were frightened yeah. of it. And it has a lot of bad news in it. It but does. only good news for those I'm, who know Jesus Christ. I'm glad even with angels as your motif that your focus remains on Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Because the center of the Bible is always Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's victory. Well, you Amen. can't say more than that, I'll tell you. Amen. Well, folks, uh, that's our time for this program. And I want to thank uh, Shalise Stevens for joining us. And I pray the Lord will continue to use her great artistic talents to bring honor and glory to His name. Folks, in just a moment, Nathan will return to tell you how to get a copy of his new book. Meanwhile, in behalf of all of us here at Lamb and Lion Ministries, I want to thank you for watching our program today. I hope it has been a blessing to you, and I hope the Lord willing that you'll be back with us again next week. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. Hello, my name is Nathan Jones, author of The Mighty Angels of Revelation. After my parents miraculously survived a devastating car wreck with the supposed help of an angel, I began to explore my own skepticism about the possibility that angels are active in our world today. I was challenged to seek out one of the greatest sources in the study of angels, the book of Revelation, with its whopping 72 instances of angels and demons. Out of my studies I wrote The Mighty Angels of Revelation. In this book I explore the writings of a man known as The Elder, visited in exile by the glorified Jesus Christ and shown the future. The Elder recorded how God will soon judge humanity with 21 judgments before installing His Son as King over all the earth. Throughout all of these cataclysmic world-changing events, God's mighty angels are revealed to be hard at work in the service to their King. In this book you will encounter angels such as the Seraphim, the Wind Angel, the Red Dragon, the Trumpet Judgment Angel, the Bowl Judgment Angel, and nearly 70 more you'll come away with a greater understanding of how God uses His mighty angels in your life today and in the future as told throughout the book of Revelation. And you'll gain a renewed sense of hope that will guide you in these troubling last days. So come, travel along with the Elder and his angelic guide as the end times are revealed in stunning detail. Along the way, encounter 72 of God's mightiest angels as they proclaim God's messages of warning and hope to a lost world. Together, let us explore the mighty angels of Revelation. Order your copy online at lamblion.com or call the number you see on the screen. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 